So now let's welcome Pete and Sid from uh, Toshi. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from the break. Uh, I want to start off with a quick thank you to Derek and to Dan. Thank you so much for bringing us all together. I think it's awesome. It's, it's just like great to have, yeah. It's awesome to have all of the wallet builders here in one room. Uh, I think there's a lot we can get done together. Uh, just want to get, uh, kind of explain why we've chosen this topic today. Uh, Web3 today feels like the internet back in 1995, right? Like which browser you use determines which dApps you can access. And that's just not, you know, if we want to be decentralized, we want to be interoperable, that's not the state that we want. So we should try and fix that. And uh, we don't often get opportunities like this. And so that's why we thought this would be a great forum to tackle interoperability. So our goal for today is I'm going to do a quick introduction to what Toshi is for those who don't know, but then list some of the issues that we've been grappling with as DAP browser providers, uh, and maybe start a conversation around how we can start to fix it. And uh, Dan already covered a bunch of these today, so it'd be good to just revisit and see if we can push closer to a solution. So just uh, Toshi, for those who don't know, Toshi is Coinbase's user-controlled wallet. Uh, you can see your tokens and your collectibles as well as your ETH. Uh, we're also a DAP browser. And then finally, we have a WhatsApp-style messenger, but with crypto payments in there. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Pete, uh, as some of you know, Pete uh, built Cypher Browser, uh, super talented builder. Uh, we were really lucky to have him come on board the Toshi team and join forces, uh, and uh, just happy to have him on board, yeah. Hi, everybody. We kind of expected this was gonna be like an informal, like a gathering uh, where people just talk about stuff and not really present, so this is the only pretty slide you're gonna see. Uh, from now on, it's gonna be really ugly. And we're going to be repeating a lot of the things that you know a few like other presenters have mentioned before. Like Dan, I think covered a lot you know that we are going to talk about, which is kind of unfortunate. But I guess that means we all agree that there is an issue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's start with Web3 injection. So right now, Web3 is you know sort of in injected immediately after DOM is initialized, right? Uh, and that's you know bad for a lot of different reasons. Like for privacy. I mean, we talked about it earlier, but yeah, we don't want you know apps to know, or any random apps, or even ads to know your address, or, or that uh, you are like, a, like an Ethereum user, right? That, that could also be uh, problematic. And once we have start having uh, other services like identity services built on top of Web3, it's, the problem is going to get much worse. Um, uh, reliability. Um, Web3 injection is really hacky, at least on Android right now. So the way it works in Android is um, I, uh, uh, so there's a web view, there's a web view, and there's a delegate method that allows you to intercept requests, but that method, the callback, only gets called like when certain conditions meet. So, for example, if it's a get request, uh, if it's a, if it's a post request, then it doesn't get called for for whatever reason. It, it's a bug in Android that's been there like since many years ago, and nobody wants to fix it because you know Google. Um, uh, and uh, um, if, if you use service workers, and if the uh, the page is rendered. Um, uh, by the service worker, if it's cached in service worker, again, like that, that method doesn't get called. So what we end up having to do is either disable service worker or like what that happens, you know, get the content and then um, uh, wait for wait for it to load, um, take the content and then inject Web3 and then reload the page with that content. You have to do a lot of crazy hacks to make that work. So so it's it's pretty bad. Uh, and also right now we all injecting Web3.js. But I think um, you know a lot of people prefer to use other client libraries like Ethers.js or ETHJS. So um, you, you, it's possible to have multiple instances of those um, in the same um, uh, namespace. But you know it's kind of wasteful. It's also sometimes real unre unreliable. Yeah, um, and also usability. Yeah, users don't get to pick an account before DAP is initialized. And also, um, not just account, but also network. You know, some DEPs only run on different, uh, only run on test nets. Some DEPs, I don't know, um, uh, only run on mainnet, obviously. So, like a, like a way to give the user to switch network and switch account before putting the DEP would be pretty useful too. Um, so, I think what we should do is uh, we should inject Web3 on demand, and we don't know how we should do it. I think it's still being discussed right now. Uh, there's actually a MetaMask uh, GitHub issue 
that uh, where like some discussion is happening, but there's not much. Well, it's it's not enough. So I think everyone should go in and um, leave comments. Uh, and also, we should uh, instead of injecting Web three and also like Web three, there are many different versions, right? Like I think the one that MetaMask is injecting right now is point two zero dot two, I think, or dot three. Uh, 1.0 has been in beta forever, but it's not stable yet. So um, the latest stable is 0 0.20. But a lot of dApps are starting to use 1.0, and they have to initialize their own um, uh, Web3 and try to use a, the provider um, with, uh, provider that was injected. And it sometimes doesn't really work well. So um, instead of doing that, uh, there's something called Ethereum provider, uh, the GitHub issues. Yeah, it's uh, interfaces slash issue 16. So it's a, it's a very lightweight object. Um, it only has like two methods, I think, uh, send and dot on, I think. Uh, well, I guess there's dot on, so there's probably like dot off or dot once too. But, but yeah, it's a very lightweight object. And um, I think, I'm not sure if uh, Web3.js, Ether.js, and ETH.js can already work with Ethereum provider because uh, it hasn't been imp implemented by any client yet. Right? I, I don't think bit of us implements that yet, right? Ethereum provider API? Uh, no, we, we just say use the current provider. It's basically the same thing. Okay, all right, yeah. Um, so yeah, another way to do it is web3.current provider, but then you know, web3.current provider kind of is, you know, makes an assumption that window.web3 object is injected as well. So I, you know, we should uh, try to move towards that. Um, and also, yeah, signature worth, uh, again, I think Dan mentioned it earlier. Um, <laughs> I changed it, yeah, <laughs> earlier. <laughs> um, so early uh, implementation of ETHSign didn't require the Ethereum sign message prefix, and uh, because of that, dApps could trick you into like signing any arbitrage message, uh, arbitrary message, including like a proper Ethereum transaction, right? Uh, which is pretty bad, then all you see is like, you know, hacks, right? Like. Uh, a sequence of bytes and hacks, and people don't really know what it is, so they'll just click accept, and suddenly your, all your money's gone. Um, so uh, it was revised later, uh, so that uh, pre prefix is required, which makes signing any arbitrary data like is uh, impossible. Uh, but because of uh, one DAP, uh, Ether Delta, which was relying on like the old ETH sign for a long time. MetaMask couldn't um, imp uh, implement the uh, improved version of its sign, um, which is uh, kind of unfortunate, but you know, it's like it the Delta at one point was like 80, 90% of all traffic uh, uh, handled by Infura, so I, I guess I can understand why. Um, so instead, like the, I think the, uh, the, the workaround was to use personal sign and have personal sign have the, uh, the Ethereum sign message prefix. But people are like still to this day like still using ETH sign. I don't know why. I, I, I come across dApps that are still using ETH sign and you see a really scary message. MetaMask displays like a really scary message. This is really dangerous. You, you might lose all your money and like, you know, it may have unintended consequences. Don't do it, but people still do it. Because people are getting sort of accustomed to doing it now. You know, everybody uses ETH sign to like log in and, I mean, it, it, the way it's displayed today, like the text doesn't make sense. Like what you're signing, you have no idea what you're signing. Um, so like people are just accepting it. Yeah, it doesn't show like an ETH value that is transferred anywhere. So people think it's okay and just sign it. So it's it's pretty bad. Um, uh, but I think we should just deprecate uh, the old um, ETH sign. I think ETH Delta also. I think they updated the contract and no longer rely on the. Uh, the older unsafe is uh, is sign, so we should just deprecate and and move to the one that has the Ethereum signed message prefix. Um, personal sign, actually. So um, the uh, the JSON RPC methods that start with personal usually uh, are like um, uh, so this yeah so this this each sign and this personal sign and difference was supposed to be that like personal sign can accept a password. But uh, like that doesn't make sense in like in the context of DApps, right? Like you're not gonna give a DApp some password, and a DApp is gonna then send it. That that makes no sense whatsoever. So um, um, I mean, it was I think the 
the best workaround that MetaMask could have done, like to support both, I think. Uh, uh, but like using personal score methods, uh, it kind of doesn't make sense in, 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 in dApps. Um, and also, uh, even with a boarding message, the personal sign and east sign, the window kind of still looks the same. So look the same. So people still, you know, just blindly approve and sign messages. So um, so yeah, um, we need to solve this problem somehow. Uh, east sign type data. So this is an answer to um, east sign and personal sign showing um, a window containing a message that users just cannot like comprehend, right? Like it's, a, it's an attempt to create like a human readable form of each sign. And it's great. And uh, Sergey uh, from Spankchain and Mil Milchinami, I don't know how to pronounce this, Machinami, I forget, yeah, how to pronounce that company, but uh, added it to, to MetaMask. Uh, it's a very early version of each sign type data. And uh, it's much better than each sign. Um, you can see, well, sort of, it's, it's much better in that it's much more human readable. It's not, it's still not English. It's, it looks like a, like a JSON object, right? Like key value, key value, but still better than like sequence of hacks, right? So it's much better. Um, but the problem is that uh, when it was added, it wasn't uh, like vendor prefixed, kind of like how uh, when a new JavaScript um, uh, function is added uh, to a browser or like a new CSS property is added, they usually have a prefix, right? Like WebKit or Moz or MS, but it, that didn't have that. And people started using it. Um, Sergey added it specifically to support SpecChain auction contracts and his state channel implementation. Uh, and the um, problem is um, like these contracts, it's, it's kind of hard to upgrade them unless you've thought about it, right? So once you're stuck with an implementation, it's like you're going to have to deploy a new contract and have uh, direct users to a new contract, new new contract that's compatible with uh, like a newer vision of signed uh, signed message method. Um, that's not trivial. So um, like we don't want people to be using experimental features um, because it's really hard to revert later or uh, change it. Um, so um, since it was first implemented, um, or rather, it, since it was first added to MetaMask, uh, the revision, 